Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Etienne. So, uh, and it's an absolute privilege to stand here in the shadow of some greats, you know, to, to talk to you about something that I feel very passionately about. You know, I've been doing this for 25 years and uh, I don't think that passion ever left me. So, uh, first of all, here's my detail on the screen. So, um, do follow me on Twitter. It does give me a bit of a, you know, energy boost and it makes me feel important if people follow me on Twitter. But hopefully, <laughs> there's some useful information on, uh, on, on, on the feed, okay? So now, what I want to talk to you about today is the power of analogies and how analogies shape our thinking about IT security and the jobs we do every day. And uh, it's, it's a story about lions and bulls and some other stuff in between, including Mr. Trump and a few, few others. So the thing is, in Africa, as you can tell, I'm from Africa, we wake up every morning, and if you're a lion, you know that you have to run very quickly because you have to catch the antelope. Because if you don't, you're going to starve, and that's not good. If you're an antelope, the same is true. You wake up every morning, and you've got a single goal. You need to outrun that lion. If you don't, it's going to be food, and that's not nice either. So really, basically in Africa, when you wake up in the morning, you start running. And that's very similar to what we do in information security. Every morning, we wake up. We look at our feeds, you know, all the stuff that's happened last night. We look at our emails. We look at our consoles. And we hopefully will make some decisions based on these different things. And hopefully, we'll outrun the, the lions. And you may have heard of this analogy, people saying that you don't have to outrun all the lines, you just have to outrun the slowest other antelope. So in other words, as long as you're not the worst person, you won't be hacked. And it's a very popular analogy, that. Why? Because it makes us think there's a causal relationship between our amount of spending, the spending we do on security, and not being hacked. Unfortunately, it's a very flawed uh, analogy, and I'll demonstrate to you why I think that's a flawed analogy. I think a better analogy is the following. And uh, this is a bull run in Pompelona, okay? So there's 875 meters of sheer panic. And basically what this is, there's six bulls, and uh, led by six steers, you know. So the bulls are running the same route on the way to the bull ring for that, that, that evening's entertainment, if you're into that kind of thing, which I'm not. And there's six steers amongst them, just to show them the ropes. Because, you know, the steers run the route every week of that seven-day festival. In any event, in this kind of narrow arena, um, you've got the six bulls, six steers, there's three other steers too, and these various runners. And like in IT security and businesses, if you think of the, the runners as the business, you get different kinds of runners. You know, you get the, the methodical runners, these are people that will comply to all the frameworks and they're very methodical. You can see them here, they're checking out the scene and they're trying to figure out what the best, best way is. You get the fast and professional ones, these are the guys who have been running every day doing triathlons and that's the guy in front here. You can see he's, he's just going to outrun the rest of the guys, you know, as long as he's good. And you've got all these different kinds of runners. Now, at the same time, you also get different kinds of bulls in this bull ring, okay? So not all bulls are equal and not all runners are equal. So, at the bottom, you get the young and enthusiastic bull. That's a, the guy that just learned about compromising and hacking. He's just watched the video on YouTube. He's just done a course at Black Hat, and he's going to go out there and get those pesky runners, those businesses. Then, of course, you get the lucky bull. This is something that stumbles across an open Amazon bucket with lots of information on it, okay? And the list goes down till you get to the bottom to the, the state-sponsored Super Bowl. Now, this is a bull that can bench press his own weight in bulls, you know. He's been training for a long time, you know, he's on steroids, and he knows, he knows he's going to get his runner. That's it, you know. If you're up against this state-sponsored Super Bowl, the one on the left is actually a buffalo, but hey, give me some petting just license here. <laughs> You've had it. <laughs> you're toast, okay. And the reality is this, is that you can outrun some of the bulls some of the time, but not all of the bulls all of the time. And, the, and <laughs> where the analogy is very apt, actually, is that, or not apt, actually, is that in this 875 yards, there's like a double barrier. You can opt out. So if you think this bull is kind of close, you can just duck through the barrier and just wait, get for the show to go past. Whereas, of course, with IT security, we can't do that. You know, there's no opportunity for us just to opt out for a little bit and avoid that, that pesky state-sponsored Super Bowl that can bench press his own weight in bulls. There's no chance for us to... To do that. So the reality is that 
security is more like this. We share the same, the same internet, the same 875 yards. And in this space, we've got the super bulls, you've got the opportunistic bulls, the lucky bulls, and you've got these different runners. And, and all these things are, a, are working together. And if you're just unlucky or maybe you stumble, that means that you are potentially a, a victim. Now, so that's a bad picture. So let's look at the, the bigger picture. If I take that proverbial step up, you know, I've taken the drone, I've gone up now, and I look at all this chaos underneath me, and I'm trying to understand, in this environment where I've got all these bulls, I've got the different attitudes towards security in terms of how we're going to protect ourselves, what are the big picture things I should worry about? And uh, so I've got eight things here. Two, four, six, eight. Yes, eight. Good thing it adds up. You know, I was checking before the time. I've got eight things here. I want to explore very quickly each of these eight areas that I think are shaping our industry. And each of these eight is probably worth a hour presentation in its own right. You know? So uh, if you ever have the unfortunate luck of sitting next to me on the plane, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a long flight, I can tell you. So, so let's look at each of these eight. So the first thing is the innovation of monetization of cyber criminals. Now, <laughs> I've been doing this for 25 years. And the reality is, for the first 15 years, hacking didn't pay. We told people bad stuff will happen, and if you don't buy those firewalls and those IDSs, and if you didn't buy some expensive stuff, really bad stuff will happen. They're the builder thing. You know, and, but the reality is it didn't. What's happened, though, is that there was a whole criminal ecosystem that built up around pharma spam. And these guys were basically making money selling Lipitor and Viagra and all these different medicines on the internet. And they've got affiliate fees and that whole ecosystem. You know, the referrers, you have the people that send the spam, you have the fulfillment, you have the suppliers, whole ecosystem. The payment providers shut down that ecosystem about, properly about six, seven years ago. And all of a sudden, you had all these guys that had mortgages to pay, that lifestyles to, <laughs> that kids in school, you know, and, and they woke up and pff, what do they do next? And what then happened is that these guys had to find a different way of, of making, making money, okay? And, and actually, this at the same time, with the rise of cryptocurrencies, actually meant that these guys were looking for new ways. And because of cryptocurrency arising at the same time, they found a different way of making money, which actually meant that this old analogy of I just have to outrun the, the, you know, the, my mates, the other slow ant antelopes is gone, because everybody's a target now. And uh, let's talk about that briefly, okay? So, Ransomware started, as you see here in 2012, there's this favorite quote of mine. You know, this is quite a well-known journalist in eWeek. I've not put his name down because it would be unfair. And his prognosis at that stage was that ransomware is a passing fad. It's going to go away. Don't worry about it, you know. This is just a temporary measure until people find a better way of making money. Now, why did he say that? He wasn't stupid. You know, he was well-informed. He understood his industry. But it was because it was quite difficult to get the money out. So if you encrypted somebody's laptop, there was all kinds of way. You had to buy some Ucash, even iTunes vouchers, which you put in the post, sent to the criminal. And once he got the iTunes voucher, he would decrypt your, your drive or send you an email with the decryption key. But the, the problem was there was always a trail. Now, with cryptocurrencies, of course, that's changed. And that's changed in a few ways. First of all, there's a fairly anonymous way now of extracting money from your, from your victim. Now, that manifests with ransomware. It's manifest with DDoS, it's starting to manifest with extortion and with a blackmail, as we saw in the case of Uber, where the criminal said, we will disclose to the authorities that we compromised you unless you give us some, some Bitcoin. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But the reality is, is that the fact that, that criminals are making some real hard cash out of things like extortion, denial of service, ransomware, and have a way of actually getting the money out has now meant that it's actually starting to pay at a much wider scale, and pretty much everybody a, is a target, which, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we do about that in a minute. So, so really, if you look at ransomware, I've got a stat up here from uh, uh, Recorded Future, which is a threat intel crowd that kind of monitors uh, what's going on there. And you can see it started off in uh, 2013, and just steadily ransomware has become a major issue for, for, for businesses. And as I said, it's because of cryptocurrencies. Now, I think... Cryptocurrencies, quite apart from the specter of power of it and uh, the bubble or not bubble, it depends on who, who you are. I think the consensus are if, you, if you're a speculator, it's not a bubble. If you're not a speculator, it is a bubble. But in any event, so 
cryptocurrencies actually, we believe, will actually shape the cybersecurity industry for, for years to come. And I'll, let me talk a little bit about that. So one of the things that I think crypto will disrupt already, quite apart from ransomware, quite apart from the criminal aspect, is the whole concept of um, advertising and websites. So to have content on websites, you know, like The Guardian, we have proper journalistic content. Effectively, what you do is you exchange that content for somebody's eyes to watch an ad. And they get money via this way, and there's an affiliate network around that. Okay? What we are starting to see is that websites are starting to exchange your browser's processing power for viewing the content. So in other words, I'm busy going to a website, and people like CoinHive has some Java that runs on the website. And while you're on the website, your browser is busy performing calculations that mines Bitcoin, which then means that both the owner of the content gets some money and CoinHive gets, gets some money. So effectively, now what you're doing is you're exchanging the browser's time for, for the content. And, this, and, and we are starting to see this is already starting to disrupt the advertising market in the sense that a lot of websites are, are putting this on there rather than advertising. Now, of course, <laughs> at the same time, the bad guys are starting to do it. Now, we have a very well-established managed threat detection practice where we look at about 50 billion events um, a day now. And one of the things that we're starting to see a lot is that well-known websites are being compromised and people put crypto mining software on there. I'm coming back to this whole thing about everybody being a target. What we're also starting to see is that endpoints are being compromised and people are putting, rather than using the endpoints to spread spam or DDoS, they're putting crypto miners on there. Why? Because they mine for the crypto, they send it to a site anonymously, and of course the controller of all these, these endpoints make quite a lot of money out of it. And this is something that we're going to see a lot of. And of course, at the same time, CoinHive also got hacked using a, a previously used password. And by the way, I noticed that on your chairs, there's something here from the, I think it's the Tactical Task Force. There's some really good information on there. And the website's on there. It's really worth a read. So if you take that little, I don't know, I'm not giving you a plug here, but that's a very good brochure. And one of the top things there is passwords. And today, you know, when I started security 25 years ago, I can remember my first meeting. I talked about the importance of passwords. And I joined this industry because it's fast changing, it's dynamic, it's interesting. 25 years later, I'm still talking about bloody passwords. I should not be talking about passwords now, today. But we still are. And still the most common reason why sites are compromised, including something like uh, CoinHive, where hackers broke into the website and stole all the Bitcoin that they were mining on all these affiliate networks, which was quite distressing for the investors in, in uh, CoinHive. Any event. So now the next thing that really is driving our, our industry to a large degree is government spending on cyber. And the story of our time is, is President Trump, you know, even as we speak, probably flying into Davos to, to thrill the world with his anti-globalization views. And uh, I'm so gutted I'm missing that, 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 that speech. I'm sure you all are gutted that you're missing that <laughs> speech at Davos. But anyway, um, thanks for being here rather than watching him. Anyway, uh, as we all know, the story of our times, there's, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a high degree of probability that the Russians were extremely involved in the election of Mr. Trump as the, next, the 45th president of the United States. Now, of course, this all started <laughs> uh, um, uh, with the shadow brokers, and I won't go into massive detail about it because it's a very well told, told story. But the long and short of it is, is that this crowd called the, um, the shadow brokers leaked some tools onto the internet, which was developed by the National Security Agency, a, a group within there called Tailored Access Operations, which were then used to, in the presidential campaign and subsequently were used with the Petya ransomware and was used by WannaCry. But literally, this is a, a, a state-sponsored Super Bowl, bench pressing steroids, that developed this fantastic tool that got into the common domain and became part of our civilian internet. So, and of course, this tool got used a lot, um, you know, of, including by this man, you know. Uh, I don't, I, I'm trying to verify, I don't think this photo is accurate, you know. I think there may <laughs> possibly some Photoshop involved in here, but hey, it's a nice photo. <laughs> so, um, anyway, including by the Putin regime to, to influence the election, not just in America, but more recently in France, but, 
uh, allegedly with, with Brexit and so forth. And ultimately, the biggest one, which is quite interesting, was the, the, the Petra ransomware, which for me is quite interesting in the sense that to be affected by, by Petra, you didn't have to have external vulnerability. All you needed to do was to use a software called Emidocs, which you needed to file your taxes in Ukraine. So if you were a business like WPP, like Maersk, like whoever else who traded in the Ukraine, you had the software called Emidocs. 80% of people used the software's two packages. In any event, as part of the update to Emidocs, the machines got infected with using this ransomware, and then they, they used hacking techniques to spread, you know, past the hash. In other words, if you shared passwords, admin passwords, passwords again, you know, if you shared admin passwords, it spread across your network, and it all, and actually it was quite a sophisticated supply chain attack, almost certainly done by the Russians. It was started on Ukrainian Independence Day. Uh, you know, all the markers are that it was Russia using their their cyber might just to demonstrate they can actually use cyber to further their, their foreign policy uh, aims. In any event, but this is not the only people. It's not just the uh, Russians doing it. You know, there's again uh, a lot of speculation, but probably well-founded speculation that the Americans, you know, Obama didn't do much from a conventional warfare point of view in Korea, but a lot of the missile tests went wrong for <coughs> unexplained reasons. And the thinking is that the Americans hacked into the North Korean missile program and were messing with the telemetry in the same way as they messed with the Stuxnet, you know, with the uranium enrichment stuff in the Tans 10 years prior to that to, to, to stop the Iranian, um, you know, nuclear program. So there's, there's an extremely good chance that it, that's actually what, what the, the U.S. did. And of course, every now and then, I don't know, when the Russians feel like doing something better, what should we do now? This message, Ukrainians, press a button, the dip the power grid. And there's actually quite, quite good evidence that the, U, the Russians are actually showing that they can control the, the Ukrainian power grid at will. Now, of course, <laughs> smaller countries like um, Vietnam, in this case, can't compete with the conventional nations because they, can't, they don't have carrier-grade capability. Because in military parlance, if you have a carrier, you can now deploy your conventional might remotely by moving the carrier off the coast of the place and you can get your, your um, helicopters and your planes and your troops, ground troops there. In cyber, though, the playing field is a little bit more level. And what we are starting to see is that smaller countries are using cyber in the way that levels the playing fields, you know, including Vietnam, including North Korea, by the way. North Korea, again, <laughs> um, North Korea is thought to be behind a lot of the ransomware, and they actually use the proceeds from ransomware to fund a lot of the internal activity. You know, so it's a form of uh, foreign aid. And by the way, not foreign aid. Well, this is a form of foreign aid. You're all paying for the North Koreans to do what they're doing. So, so more, uh, and actually, it's not the only people. You know, one of my favorite stories about Bitcoin, by the way, just very quickly, is that <laughs> the Bulgarian government seized a lot of Bitcoin from a uh, uh, illegal operation, you know, it's like illegal import-export operation, you know, criminals who used, were, were forging manifest and getting uh, goods in at a lot cheaper and then pocketing the difference, okay? But anyway, they, they stashed this all in Bitcoin. Ukraine, the, the, the Bulgarian government um, seized this ring and seized all the Bitcoin. When they actually tallied the accounts this year, the Bitcoin rose so much that it's now worth a fifth of Bulgaria's national debt. <laughs> a fifth of their national debt. That's how quickly Bitcoin has risen. So, it's not just uh, North Koreans using Bitcoin. Bulgaria also uses Bitcoin to, as a form of foreign aid, so to speak. Anyway, so now, given all this lot, you know, so now we've got the, the U.S. Super Bowl running around. We've got the Vietnamese getting in on that, the North Koreans, the Russians. There's now this thought, okay? We as businesses, and, and I see a lot of businesses in the room, how do we defend ourselves against this state-sponsored Super Bowl? It's impossible. You know, <laughs> surely government has a role to play. And 100% and right, you know. And this is my favorite quote from Not Petya. This is an article, I don't read Danish, Google Translate to rescue, but it's my favorite article of Petya. <clears throat> and basically, the, the gist of this article is this. The journalist is extremely annoyed. She's so annoyed, you know, she's spitting feathers. Because she went to a local shop to buy rye bread. And they were all out of rye bread. Why? Because the Maersk ship that was supposed to deliver the grain to the bakery to bake the rye bread couldn't deliver. Because not Petya infected Maersk. So this woman's saying, 
guys, what up? I can't buy my rye bread. Surely, surely, you should do something to protect our country so we don't have a rye bread crisis again. You know, in South Africa, we don't have water. You know, we have real problems here. <laughs> in Norway, no rye bread. I've, I don't know. I'm not sure which is the most important, but hey, I'll leave, leave for you to judge. The reality is, is that, and this is from an uh, article, I think it's from the Washington Post. The reality is this, is that because of the state involvement in hacking, because of the, this, the nature of the internet, the time has come when we now are operating on the civilian internet, sharing the civilian internet with all these different bulls running around. And yes, it is time to, to at least acknowledge this, to realize that it's not just us fighting against spotty, spotty teenagers. We are fighting against these state-sponsored Super Bowls that has got virtually unlimited resources. And because, not that they are out there to hack us, but the tools find their way onto the civilian internet and then get used by hackers, like with Petya, WannaCry, and a number of other attacks. So anyway, so, so one of the things that government do, they have a few levers, not many levers, and that's why I like this brochure a lot, is that they've got a policy lever, Think about Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus. They've got another lever in terms of maybe protecting the, 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 the internet in the UK, and which is why you know, um, the NSC is talking about the, the Great Firewall of Britain, which is not a bad idea, to be honest, you know, because you know, as, a, as a civilian organization, what chance do you have against these guys? So government does have a role to play. And what I do see is happening, which is interesting, and I've been involved in a few of these meetings, is that... Um, we are starting to have meetings with, in Downing Street talking about how we protect civilian businesses and critical infrastructure. So actually, this whole working of, of government together with, with businesses is starting to happen, which is really, really important. Now, of course, how do we plug the gap? So of course, when you comply to a certain set of standards and maybe cyber essentials, the gap, of course, you plug the gap using insurance. A little bit similar to a home setup where... At home, if I buy insurance, my insurance is a lot cheaper if I take certain measures. You know, if I've got a certain grade of lock, if I've got a certain level of security, maybe monitored alarm, my insurance is cheaper. And, and what we are starting to see already in the US, this is a guy called Ed Perlmutter. And what he's proposing, and he's, it's in front uh, of the Senate at the moment, is, is in the US that if businesses buy cyber insurance and they follow the NIST standard for, for cybersecurity, that the state will give them a 15% 15, 15 tax rebate. Which is quite interesting. So what we are starting to see now is that government is starting to use that policy lever to, to say that if you comply to standards, you know, there's perhaps less of a risk. And that then means that your cyber insurance is cheaper. So we're starting to realize that the state's got a role to play in terms of overall protection, the frameworks, the, the governance. But businesses also have a role to play in terms of following those frameworks and then covering the residu residual risk using cyber insurance. So I think cyber insurance will play a major role in our industry in the next five years. Okay, so the next one is cyber balkanization. Now, this is one of my uh, favorite stories. It's a developing story. There's a fresh angle to it this morning, which I won't talk about, but it all starts with Kaspersky. And uh, you probably would have heard this, maybe you've not heard this story, but it's a, this story would have been funny if it wasn't so tragic. Okay, so. So why is Kaspersky the bad kid on the block? Why do people not want to run Kaspersky? The reason is that there was a guy that worked for Tailored Access Operations, a very, the secret part of the NSA that created these tools to access stuff remotely. He's a contractor. He worked for Booz Allen Hamilton, the same guys that employed Snowden. <laughs> you know, and so they got form. You know, so, uh, government contractors, clearly they can't trust normal people. They have to use a contractor. Anyway, this guy has been taking work home for the last 15 years. If you work for TAO, you're not allowed to take work home. You kind of work, pitch in the morning, you lock your laptop and your phone in a secure box, you go in, do your work, and you go home. He's been taking stuff home on a memory stick, okay? So one evening, he needed to do a report. He needed to write up a report. But he was a cheap bugger too. He didn't want to buy a version of Office. So what do, what do you do? What do most right-thinking high end security professionals do that work for a top secret organization developing secret tools. You download a keygen. So you download a keygen, as you do. And as you ran this keygen, Kaspersky popped up saying, mm -mm, this thing's got a known backdoor in it. Probably not a good idea to, to run it. 
So what did you do? The same with Kaspersky, of course. <laughs> you need to get the key. <laughs> so you ran a key gen, got his key, um, typed into his OK version of Office. Office started working. He re-enabled Kaspersky, because you know, you're a security guy. You can't not, not run <laughs> antivirus on your desktop, OK? Of course, Kaspersky popped up saying, this back door, and at the same time, because it picked up the back door, it started scanning his whole net, his whole machine, and it discovered all these other hacking tools. Now, of course, if you have an AV package, most AV packages, you sign up to this right for them to inspect files that are potentially suspicious. So all these things got uploaded to Moscow. It's part of a license agreement. Okay? This was bad. <laughs> There's some really top secret hacking tools that are now sitting in Moscow, okay? How do we know this? The Israelis hacked. Kaspersky a couple of years before the time, and they told the Americans. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, can you? <laughs> so in any event, so the, the point is, what does balkanization mean, okay? This now means that even Barclays have recommended people don't run Kaspersky. If you in the UK government dealing with top secret information, they don't want you to run Kaspersky. Local authorities are starting to ask us, should I run Kaspersky? My Uber driver, when he found out I work for Secure Data, I said, should I run Kaspersky? And I'm like, mm -hmm. it's the first time I had a security conversation with an Uber driver. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so the reality is, is that what's starting to happen is people are starting to care about the provenance of the software. And in the end, it's about picking your poison. Make no mistake, if you're running Sophos, GCHQ, it's literally down the road. I don't think they're collaborating, but you'll be stupid if GCHQ don't have somebody working for Sophos. Okay, and so it's about picking your poison. And I think what we are starting to see is that people are starting to worry about where the software comes from. And this trend, it's a worrying trend because I don't know where it's going to end. Do we stop running Huawei? Do, um, you know, companies in, 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 in the old East stop running Office or Semantic? You know, so I think this thing will play out and people will start worrying a lot more about provenance. And there's a lot more to see in this. So effectively getting to the state where people are mistrusting each, every, everybody else. Okay, so now, the next thing now is, of course, regulation, and I see there was plenty of presentations about GDPR, okay? But the one thing I do want to talk about is this, is that sometimes, because of the fines, mostly the fines, you get unwanted behavior that you're not expecting. And the story here is from Freakonomics. So this is a, um, a kindergarten in, in Tel Aviv. They had a problem. The parents were late. They were shoddy. They didn't pick up the kids on time. And what this meant is that the teachers had to stay after hours. And the double time, it was inconvenient, it just messed up everybody, okay? So what they, they thought of a clever plan. You're gonna charge a fine if the people are late. Of course, what happened then is, everyone was late. Because now it became a financial transaction. I'm late, but I'm giving you money. So that's all right. <laughs> so it's kind of almost like justifying being late because I've given money for it, I'm actually now paying for a service which kind of creates the exactly opposite effect. How this relates back to, to, to GDPR is that what we are starting to see is that, and we saw it with the Data Protection Act already, is that potentially people to avoid disclosing breaches, if somebody breaches them, might actually do what they did to Uber and say, we won't tell the ICO, we won't tell the world that we've got a lot of your records if you give us some money. So, and we are, we are starting to see the rise of extortion where, and I think, especially with GDPR coming in and the potential fines, that will become a bigger issue. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, keep a lot of time for questions. I have another four minutes, and then we'll allow time for some questions, you know, if there's any questions from the floor. So, so now, this analogy in practice, okay. Now, I do not recommend this as a way of doing the bull run, by the way. You know, this is not a public service uh, advisory service and how to do the bull run in Pompeloma. Okay, so, so what do we do about these things in practice? The reality is that we all know we've got all these different bulls out there, and we've got a threat landscape. Now, for the, you know, I know some of you may have spotted this is not a bull, this is not a lion, this is an elephant, I know. But the, the point is, how do I, given the threat landscape, all these different bulls running around, all these big things that's out there, how do I protect myself? Now, traditionally, what we do is, the first level is we have some firewalls. And, you know, there's a lot of people upstairs that will, that will provide you with lots of fantastic tools, including secure data, okay? The reality is, is that they only cover part of the threat landscape. You know, they protect you, but they don't do the whole job, okay? So, of course, we know that, so we say, okay, all right. We're also going to do some assessments. We're going to get some pesky hackers or ethical hackers to try to hack our network and effectively see what the issues are, so maybe we now cover a bigger part of the threat landscape here. 
But to a large degree, it overlaps with what you're projecting already. So these cars will review what you've got already for the most part. You do get some additional benefit. Then you say, okay, well, okay, now I want to plug the other gaps. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a threat detection platform. I'm going to look for these attacks against my network to try to figure out which bits that I'm not covering using my assessment and the, the, the protection technologies. But still, there's some of these gaps here in the corners. Okay. So then you say, okay, as I started off by saying, you, you, you can outrun some of the bulls some of the time, you can't outrun all the bulls all the time. So I need to have a framework in place that will respond to issues, okay? which kind of covers a lot of this residual risk. Of course, you can never cover the whole risk. The challenge is, and this is now me talking as a security professional doing this for a very long time, is that most people's attack surface isn't that. Their attack surface is a little bit bigger than they think. It includes some shadow IT. It includes some stuff sitting in AWS buckets. So it's kind of important. You need to do these different things, but you also need to really understand where your IT is manifest on, on the internet. Most of those compromises that, are, that we see in the last uh, six, year, six months, and we analyze these, it's got to do with people hacking bits that people didn't know they had. So it's kind of important to understand your tax service, then shape your protection around that too. But also realizing you can't fool everything. So now, just to summarize everything here. So what's a big picture? The first thing is that we need to understand these societal shifts. They are big shifts, and they will affect us. Government involving in cyber, spending a lot of money, these tools leaking out the internet, means that everybody is potentially a target, using military-grade tools to get to people. So you need to understand these things. We need to understand government's role in it, and we need to influence government policy as much as we can when we have the opportunity to, to do so. So it's both on the offensive and the defensive side. The next thing is that, so now, if we understand that there will be an issue at some stage, because we can't protect ourselves all the time, Visibility is important. It's at least understand what's going on in your world. Have at least some ability to detect there's a potential issue. You won't pick it up all the time, but at least if you have the ability to pick it up, you'll pick it up quicker than the average. You know, if, if I look at the Verizon breaches, the average time taken to pick up a major compromise was 179 days. That's shocking. It's just not acceptable. Okay. So, so have the ability to detect it and then to do something about it. Then the next thing is, of course, no running of these bulls. What do I do? You know, you need to accept that there's chaos. You can't fix it all the time. You need to accept that, that you can't plug all the gaps. Focus on the most important bits, passwords, user behavior, applications. You know, those are the things that are most likely going to, to, to catch you out. You know, the, the common things, you know, cloud applications, but mostly passwords. <laughs> mostly passwords, by the way. Applications and your users. 80% of compromises that's happened in the last year involved the end user. Not internal hacking. This is somebody that fished somebody, got somebody to click on a, on a download, open a document, that then compromised the machine. Anyway, and then spend a lot of time educating your users, not vilifying them. I think in IT security, we have the sense, you know, if a user does something stupid, we drag them out in the street and say, stupid, stupid user. Look at what they did again. Our stupid users. How many times do you hear about stupid users? That's akin to dragging crime victims out on the street and saying, look at that stupid person, their house got burgled. They must be very stupid. We don't do that, do we? In security, we do. So it's all about educating our users and the policy makers and the, the people in charge of organizations to say that we work, live in this world and we need to focus on the bits that, that matter. And on that note, you'll probably be very glad to hear that I'm done. So that's exactly on time. We've got 10 minutes for questions. Etienne, thank you very much indeed for an enlightening presentation. It, it, it's always good to see the audience awake in the <laughs> after dinner, uh, lunch session. Normally you get a lot of nodding donkeys, but yes. you've achieved success there. Well, thank you. So, thank you. questions? Tess, we've got the microphone. Thank you. In the middle. Uh, thanks, Etienne, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, so, you, you mentioned passwords. Obviously, yes. I've been doing security awareness training for quite a few years, and I've been talking about password safes. What's your view on password safes? Now, I accept that. Some of the password saves were cracked uh, a few yeah. years ago. You know, uh, I, but, but actually, it's a usability issue at the core of sure. all these things. Yeah. So what's your view in solving the password issue? Um, first of all, a password safe is an excellent idea. Do it, even in your personal capacity. Okay? You know, I'm just going to share a very quick anecdotal story with you. Okay? So on this little thing here, again, I, I don't know why I'm plugging somebody else's little flyer, but it's a good flyer. There's a site called Have I Been Pwned? Do go to the site. On the site, there's two and a half billion 
username password combinations. Okay? So all that this site is, it's just a collection of all the big breaches that's happened over the last period. LinkedIn, Yahoo, Dropbox, you name it, it's all here. Okay? So, so really, all that this tells you, it doesn't tell you a bad user, it just tells you at some stage, when you were using LinkedIn, and LinkedIn was compromised, your then password and username is on this site. Okay? So we know it, and hackers know it. Okay? So all we do nowadays, I don't have to guess somebody's password. All I do is, I go to have them impound, and if I want to compromise the Bank of England, I look at all the users in have them impound, and I look at the password they used at some stage in the past. And I try two of those passwords against every user. We have a 99.99% success rate using this tactic. Of course, people reuse passwords. They are sometimes extremely clever. They put an exclamation mark in. <laughs> they put a two in when it's a one, or a three in when it's a one. You know, if they're really crafty, okay? But the reality is, a password safe or password manager removes the user's ability to know what a password is. Okay? So, so we use it. We are security business. And we use a tool called Okta, which is like a single sign-on tool. My users never know their passwords. When they leave the organization, disable them in one place, boom. All their passwords go, go away. So, so now you don't have this thing that people are reusing existing passwords. Password reuse is probably the single biggest reason why people are compromised. We sort of Monero, um, Deloitte, that business that says use strong authentication. If you don't, bad things will happen. When, when people compromise their global email server, it was an existing, existing password. This, the SEC <laughs> got compromised using a, a password reuse. ME Docs that was beyond Petya was a password. Password that was reused by administrators, which is either gone into the server to plant the stuff on the update server, which then gone into all the businesses. So yeah, I would highly recommend doing it. And the fact that one or two of them got compromised in the past, you know what? That's ones or twos. Daily, lots of people get compromised using. So it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic idea. So I'd either use a password manager or a single sign-on solution, because that will now become really friendly and usable. Yeah? I'm in the oil and gas industry. Yes. When you talk to uh, the technical side of protecting industrial control systems, sure. Yeah. That's the holy grail. Yes. I'd just like to know sure. your comments about air gap. Yeah. So the question was, in the oil and gas industry, of course, you've got SCADA and you've got these industrial control systems which are using their own protocols. And of course, they're not connected, allegedly, to, to the, the main network. The thought is, I've got this air gap. You know, this should protect me. That's my default response. So if you go up to any engineer, and I've done a lot of work with TUV in Germany around SCADA security because they will lead in that space. The default answer is, we air gapped. <laughs> We're fine. There's no problem here. But yes, there is. You know? And the reality is, is that most of these industrial control systems will have a control PC, which gets updated, and it's a pain in the backside to update them. So I don't think the air gaps are as real as people realize they, they are. And what we're also starting to see of SCADA, and you're asking of industrial control systems, they are becoming more and more IP because the protocol is easier to, to use. So, so what I would say is that to answer your question, I do not think they're as air-gapped as, as people say they are, and, and we check it. There are some SCADA kind of, kind of, kind of attacks, you know, but they, they, they're rare. What's more common is what we saw with Natanz, which is people physically doing hardware inserts. And we've actually demonstrated this, you know, where people put a little box in, they put a little USB key in, the USB key has got a, um, it's got a, a wireless chip on it, and it switches between a USB and a wireless chip randomly. And then it's got a rubber ducky on it, which becomes a keyboard. And then people infect the pieces that way. So uh, hardware inserts is the way. So I, I do not think that EGAP offers the security, because effectively somebody's after that, that, that business. Having said that, in general, um, you know, it needs to be very targeted. And it's not that often that, 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 that people will, will effectively really target a, a particular business. What, what is more common is that people will scan stuff, look for common vulnerabilities, and people do forget sometimes the SCADA systems are on the internet. And when we do pen tests, we find that more often than not. Could I ask another question? Yeah? The 2014 attack on German steel mill went in through the corporate information system. Yes. I don't know if you have any uh, more No, I do not. The question was the 2014 attack against the German steel mill, you know, which was via a, a corporate PC, you know, management information system PC. Uh, if I had any insight in it, and unfortunately I wasn't involved in that one, so I'm not. I don't. Time for one more question. Right, Etienne, you're off the hook. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I'm Thanks. Glad you can make it. Thank you.